All right, well, it's 6.30. Why don't we open up in prayer and we'll get ourselves started for the evening. I'll open us. Father God, I thank you for, I thank you for this day, Father. I thank you for the beautiful weather that we've had. And um, I pray for uh, everyone that's on the call tonight, people that are on the call tonight, Father. I just pray for wisdom and peace uh, in the world that we have here today, Father. I pray that your word illuminates us today and we all grasp some of the wisdom that's contained within these words as the author was trying to teach the Hebrews 2,000 years ago, and we'll find the, the scripture to be so relevant to us today, Father. I'm just so thankful for my friends and the fellowship that we have during these weekly Bible studies, Father, and I just uh, I pray for everyone here that they just be blessed in their, their endeavors for the rest of the week. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. 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 So we are starting here tonight, uh, chapter 4. And so what's interesting about tonight's chapter is that um, we're going to see a word that gets repeated over and over and over again. And the word is a four-letter word, and that word is rest. Um, and it'll have a lot of relevance to what we talk about tonight. And so when we actually get into the first uh, couple verses of chapter four, we're going to really see this continuation of the warning uh, about doubting that we learned from last time in chapter three. If you recall the examples with the Israelites and wandering in the desert for 40 years, the, the author here doesn't really bring that up though, but extends into chapter four the concepts that we learned in chapter three. And, and the main idea for this week and this chapter is that God invites us to enter his rest today. And I'll spend some time defining what that means. And we'll also learn how the rest that we're talking about here uh, connects to our faith, the faith that we have in Christ. So the two go together and it, it should help us to actually maintain this level of urgency in our beliefs, but also to encourage us uh, because of God's sustaining word. And the very fact the, the author here is describing the power of God's word in the scripture is also, it's also pretty cool as well. So like I said, there'll be much unrest rest through faith, uh, paralleling the rest after creation uh, with the spiritual rest in Christ. So we're going to see it from the beginning. We'll see it through Jesus, what he means by rest, but also the, the concept of, of faith being pivotal. And really, it's a warning against uh, disobedience or, or walking away or wandering in the desert for 40 years like the Israelites did. And then we have the word, the word of God, the Bible is actually portrayed as something that's powerful and discern, discerning that we'll uh, learn this week. And so once again, it, we're just going to see this uh, theme that everything in Hebrews thus far has been pointing to Jesus. And we're going to see that here again tonight. So we'll start off in verses one and two. And I think, uh, Joe, if you're done looking for Bigfoot, if you wouldn't mind taking those two, that would be great. Therefore, let us fear if while a promise remains of entering his rest, any one of you may seem to have come short of it. For indeed, we have had good news preached to us just as they also, but the word they heard did not profit them because it was not united by faith in those who heard. Okay, thank you. You know, this, this chapter starts off with this word, therefore, and it's kind of pointing to this continuation of chapter three and recalling that chapter three, there was a lot of discussion about this unbelief uh, from those that escaped Egypt as they were trying to enter Canaan. It only took them 40 years to go. Basically, the distance between Orlando and Miami is it took them 40 years to go that distance because of the the uh, the wandering they did in the, in the desert. So here we see this promise about entering his rest and that we can enter this rest by faith is what we're going to learn here tonight. Does someone say something? Nope. Okay. Oh, <laughs> oh thank you. You're, uh, you're welcome. I mean, bless you. Something like that. So this unbelief will make us fall short is the warning that we received of this rest God has for us. And so really all of us here in the Zoom tonight uh, none of us want to come up short of rest. 
not what the author is trying to convey to us here. For the place of rest is really quite wonderful. And the as Joe read, there's this there's this concern about fear. What should we be afraid of? What should we be fearful of? Well, there's a couple things that we ought to be fearful of. One is of limiting God and what God can do with us in our hearts due to our, our own unbelief. Our own unbelief hampers us from being connected to God. Psalm 78, 41 points us in that direction. Or another thing we might be fear of is um, one who doesn't believe God is good and that, that he has promised rest in his son. That's something that we shouldn't be, be thinking about. It's just wrong. You know, if we go back to the Old Testament, you know, Israel didn't believe God would actually lead them into the promised land and give them victory over the people in Canaan that live there. This is an example of just not to repeat. This is the warning that we're getting here. And then the reason that's given is says, for indeed the gospel was preached to us as well as to them. And the author is making a connection. But here's the point. Hearing God's word isn't enough. It must be received and connected with faith in order for it to reach its full potential. And I think everyone here knows that, you know, you can have two people that will hear the same message and one will benefit from it while another one does not because of what they hear and what they follow, whether or not they follow that word. And so the hearing and the following is actually demonstrating a faith. And that actually demonstration of faith leads to more of the anticipation and blessing and favor from God and what God uh, will do, do for us and do with us. Here's an application. What will keep you from enjoying the best blessing around you? That's the question. Well, if we go back to the scripture, what does the scripture say? If we believe what, the, what God has tell, tells us, he says that God will provide for our needs. He tells us that in Philippians 4.19. The scripture tells us that all things are working together for good. That comes from Romans in 8.28. It also tells us that he is with you even until the end of the world. And that's from the Gospels, from Matthew 28, 20. But this is the warning. This is what we need to refrain from. We can't be thinking, well, what's the catch? This can't be true for me. Can't be thinking that. So let me give you a Bible illustration of, of an example or demonstration of faith. If we go back to the book of Acts, and we go to the book of Acts uh, 12, in that particular chapter, if you recall, Peter's in prison. And, and Peter is freed from prison. Um, and he escapes prison. And he goes to the house. He goes to the house of Mary, who's the mother of John, and also Mark. Now, in the house at the time when Peter has escaped from prison, he's, tra he's traveling over to the house. And inside the house, they are praying and praying and praying for Peter to be released from prison. They didn't know he was released from prison. So they're praying, and all of a sudden you hear this knock, knock, knock. At the other end of the door, it's Peter. On the inside of the door, the response is, no, it can't be Peter. And so they all go back to praying. They pray that you would free Peter, God. Please free Peter. Once again, knock, knock, knock. It's Peter. No, it can't be Peter. And so they do it again until they finally realize that, yes, in fact, Peter's sitting at the door. So how much faith did they have? Well, Jesus gives us an illustration back in the Gospels about we need the faith of a mustard seed. And that's about how much faith they demonstrated in this particular scene. Jesus tells us in that particular scripture about a mustard seed that that's all it takes to move a mountain. The lesson is if you only have enough faith to pray, and that's a key, there's enough when you pray to start things happening, to start doors opening. It doesn't take much. The promises, the blessings, the good things of God happen when you take his word and you mix it with faith and shower it with prayer. That's the recipe. You take God's word, you mix it with faith, and you shower it with prayer. And it can start off sm small and like a snowball going down a hill can grow just by the very impact that God can have on our lives. Any, uh, any comments thus far, verses 1 through 2? I just have to point out is one of my 
pop culture references that you did a wonderful reenactment of the Cheech and Chong skit. Uh, Dave, it's me. Let me in. <laughs> um, I think, I, I think, thank you, Joe. I'm not sure. I think. Let's see. Joy said, is therefore used as listen carefully. Sometimes I get on the use of the word. Okay, so um, therefore is really, it's the it's the warning that came out of chapter three and really the solution that comes as we're beginning in chapter four right here. The author is having us transition into this and, and really telling us and give us this warning about entering God's rest and entering God's rest with faith and entering God's, God's rest so that we can actually have the, really God in us working through us to achieve his mission. Okay, so let's go to verses three through five. And Jasmine, if you wouldn't mind taking that, please. For we who have believed do enter that rest, as he has said. So I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. For he has spoken in a certain place and the seventh day of the seventh day in this way, and God rested on the seventh day from all his works. And again, in this place, they shall not enter my rest. Thank you, Jasmine. So we get this illustration going all the way back to Genesis. Um, so it's Jasmine read, he, we who have believed do enter that rest. So it's a pointer to those who believe. And it's a contrast so that previously mentioned people who did not enter God's rest, as the example, the, the Israelites going from Egypt to Canaan. So what keeps them from rest? Unbelief keeps many of God's, many out of God's rest. The faith of those who believe guides people, people into his rest. So unbelief keeps us away from God's rest. Faith brings us into God's rest. That's the message here that we're trying to, to learn as we get through it. And it says, my rest in this scripture. And that actually comes from Psalm 9511. And what that is doing is it's demonstrating that, that, that this rest is God's. It is his rest. And it really does go back, as the scripture alludes to, way back to Genesis chapter 2, when God finished his work and his creation, really long before Israel came, uh, into Egypt or before David actually wrote Psalm 95. The rest that, that God had initiated back in Genesis 2 happened many, many centuries before that. And so although God's works were finished from the beginning, he still speaks here of my rest, demonstrating that God still has this rest, you know, to this time. Any comments about that? That it seems like he's using rest as not a verb but a noun, like a place or a. Does that make sense? I think it does because as we dig a little bit deeper into the scripture, you know, we'll get a little bit more illumination on rest and what he means there. But yeah, this is a this is a place. You know, it can actually gets connected to the Sabbath as well as we're going to learn here as we start verses six through nine. So with that, I'm not sure which one of you two to call out, Hardys, but would you <laughs> please take six through nine? Oh, look at the pointer. I think she took it last week, John. It's <laughs> his wonderful wife, Vanna. No. <laughs> <laughs> She'll take it, Rick. My throat's a little scratchy. <laughs> I see, I see. But I'll sing, I'll warm up and I'll sing at the end of this. Okay. So. <laughs> Since therefore it remains for some to enter it, and those who formerly received the good news failed to enter because of disobedience, again he appoints a certain day, today, saying through David so long afterward in the words already quoted, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. For if Joshua had given them rest, God would not have spoken of another day later on. So then, there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. Hmm. Thank you very much, Kathy. Mm -hmm. All right, we see another transition here. It says, therefore, it remains that some must enter, uh, enter it. 
And so really the point here is that God didn't create this place of rest in vain. Uh, if Israel, when first preached, if they failed to enter because of their own disobedience, then someone else would enter into that rest. The scripture transitions into saying today, if you will hear his voice, this comes back from David in Psalm 95 verses seven and eight. And what this is trying to do is prove that there is a rest remaining for God's people to enter beyond the fulfillment under Joshua. Today emphasizes the ongoing opportunity for entering God's rest and really echoing those words that David said in the Psalms. And there's urgency in what's being conveyed in the plea and to not for someone not to harden their heart when hearing the voice of God, to be open and attentive, uh, to listen to it, is what, uh, what the author is trying to say here. And just for the sake, I'm going to go on and read verse 10 real quick to continue this on for it says, for he who has entered his rest has himself also ceased from his works as God did from his. And so entering this rest means no longer needing to work. And the idea here is that there is no longer any place for work when we think about our, our own righteousness. As we individually enter Christ, Christian salvation, it means that we need to cease from our own works and rest securely on what Christ has already done. And so with that said, this cessation from works, it's kind of this basis for this righteousness and it fulfills our Sabbath rest is, is what the, the author is saying here. God has rested from his works on the original Sabbath way back in Genesis 2 because the work was finished. We cease from self-justifying works because Jesus finished the work on the cross. Now, the thing I wanted to bring up here is that this particular scripture um, brings up the, co the topic of, of Sabbath. And I will tell you that when I was studying it, um, there's, has anyone, I know we have lots of different backgrounds that are on the, uh, on the Zoom call here. And there's, there's churches or denominations that practice the Sabbath and there's churches and denominations that don't practice the Sabbath. And I knew that as I was um, studying this, but I wanted to explore this a little bit deeper. And I want to share with you uh, what I actually found. I think you'll find it interesting. So the question is, is the Sabbath that's called out in the Old Testament, is it a requirement today? Has anyone ever heard that question asked? Show of hands if you have, right? So it's a, it's a fairly common question, and in fact, it's a fairly wide debate whether the answer is yes or, or no. So I'm going to show you something. So I did this little research on this particular topic, and the first question that I asked is, um, what denominations, what denominations um, practice the Sabbath today in this day and age? And you can see on the left side of the table, and I'm not going to go over details over it, but you can see if you look down the first column, there's a set of churches that actually practice the Sabbath. Some of them practice Saturday and practice Sunday. I have some comments in there. If anyone's interested, I'd be happy to send this to you. But the point is that there are churches today that say, absolutely, the Sabbath is required. Like, okay. So the next question was, are there any churches that contend the Sabbath is not necessary. And sure enough, there's churches, denominations that don't believe the Sabbath is necessary. And I list the churches here in the fourth column here with the day of the week. Well, they don't practice it, so none. And some comments associated with that. In some cases, um, they may or may not, a particular denomination, uh, practice the Sabbath. And, and if I come back over to the left, I look at Catholic Church or Eastern Orthodox Church, um, some may actually practice the Sabbath, but basically what's happened in, in those two areas, um, they have transferred from a Sabbath day on, say, a Saturday to the Lord's Day on the Sunday reflecting on when Jesus rose. The point is, is that thousands of years after, after Jesus, the question is, is there a Sabbath um, that exists or not? 
And so let me stop sharing for a second, maybe. Oh, why do I stop sharing? <laughs> there it goes. Okay. All right. So that began the journey, but I wasn't done with the journey. So I'm like, okay, for those, for those that support the Sabbath, believe that the Sabbath should be followed. Okay. What scriptures? Um, what's, thank you, Jasmine. There is actually several that are in, in both columns in terms of who practices or not, because even within the denomination, you'll find that some churches, they have enough independence that they can. So here's the, that, that just continued to develop the quandary. So then I asked the question, I said, what scripture actually supports the Sabbath? And you can, there's, you know, a half a dozen scriptures that support it. If you go back to the Old Testament, you can go back to the Ten Commandments with Exodus and Deuteronomy. Isaiah um, uh, supports the Sabbath. Genesis supports the Sabbath. But I'm going to jump forward to the New Covenant. I'm going to jump forward to the New Testament. Are there any scriptures that support the Sabbath rationale? And surely there are. Mark 2.27. It says, Then he, Jesus, said to them, The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So people will use that as a rationale. Yes, we need to do the Sabbath. Another one happens to be the scripture that we just read, Hebrews 4, 9, and 10. Hebrews 4, 9, and 10 is used as a case that say, yep, we need to practice the Sabbath today. Okay, great. So then the opposite side, is there any scripture that says that we don't need to do the Sabbath anymore? And sure enough, Bible, Bible studying people identify scriptures. Now in this particular case, all the scriptures are all New Covenant, all New Testament. Colossians 2, 16 through 17. Galatians 4, 9 through 11. And I'll read one, Romans 14, 5 and 6. And it says, one person considers one day more sacred than another. Another considers every day alike. Each of them should be fully convinced in their own mind. Whatever regards one day is special, so does the Lord. And guess what? Another example scripture is the same scripture, Hebrews 4, 9. So now we have, we have the both sides saying that we need to practice the, scrap, the Sabbath because of Hebrews 4. We don't need to practice the Sabbath because of the same Hebrews 4, 4, 9, 4, 9, and 10. And so oh, I'm like, okay, this is, this is not helping too much. So I asked another question. The question is, okay, you have the scriptures and and you have your beliefs. So what are, the, what are the real beliefs about why the Sabbath should be observed? And so there's some good reasons for it. One is spiritual renewal or, re, uh, renewal or rejuvenation in order to deepen our relationship with God. Uh, another reason is community and fellowship to support one another in their faith journeys. Another, another is this covenant reminder um, to make sure that we don't lose sight that we're God's chosen people. Okay, that's all good. But what about the flip side? Why do some believe that no Sabbath is required? Well, they believe that, well, there's fulfillment in Christ. The Old Testament, that, that believe that the Old Testament sa uh, Sabbath was really a pointer, a pointer into the rest in Christ and believe that Jesus is the fulfillment of the Sabbath. Or they believe that there's a new covenant em emphasis and that highlights that really the establishment of the new covenant in Christ. Or they believe that every day is sacred and we should, it doesn't, shouldn't have to set aside one day. So what's the punchline? All I've done is told you two sides of the story. What's the answer? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what it is. I would say that for each of us, it is absolutely clear. You know, I go back and I think about the Jews. The Jews, even though they had, um, even though they had the Sabbath, the Jews were were a very uh, religious per, uh, people, and so every day they would pray, they would watch what they eat, they would be clean, they would follow the practices, the laws of Moses, um, and so they would practice the Sabbath. I would say for today in the New Covenant, there is no reason not to practice the Sabbath. There's no reason whatsoever not to do it. There's nothing wrong with it. There's only good that would come out of it. But the question is, is it required? I don't know. I don't know. And when I look back and at the, the, the examples and evidence that I provided, this examples and evidence has been in debate for 2,000 years. 
poor little Rick here isn't going to solve the problem in a, a Bible study tonight. So I'll just open that up. Does anyone have any any thoughts on this one way or the other? What do you think? I grew up in the Lutheran church and it was pretty much emphasized that Sunday was the Sabbath and we were not supposed to do anything but worship God. And um, when you were grew up in the Lutheran church, was it considered a sin to actually do that or some it, other? It caused me a lot of angst when I first started to work and had to work on Sunday. Yes, mm, mm. It, it caused a lot of consternation. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I have then since come to the conclusion that, you know, you should keep God in your heart and mind every day. Yes. Um, and if you can rest on Sunday, it's, it's wonderful, but I, it, I don't see it as a punishment <laughs> anymore. That's fair. That's fair. Great comment. Any, any other thoughts? Um, I have to go uh, back. To, um, I have to go back to what, what Joe, I think was Joe said earlier you know, about what rest actually is and connect it to what you said earlier, Rick, which is basically rest is, is, you know, what is what you do after you, after you finish the work and that we don't have to, the work has already been finished for us. And so I think that rest is actually a state, you know, and, 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 and it's a continual state, right? I mean, you know, it's like, you know, once it was done, it was done, you know, but what Christ did for us. And so, so I, I think, you know, based on that right here at this moment, because I never really thought about it as hard as, it, as you're, you're making it a topic for me right now, is that uh, it is, it, it's kind of a continual thing, you know, so I don't, I don't, I don't really don't think that it, um, Kathy's fortunate, she could, she's in both columns, by the way, so. <laughs> <laughs> so, so anyway yeah but yeah i think i think it i think it's it I, I think it's kind of a continual thing and and uh you know um because it can become if if you say it's every single day then that that then then it can really become a burden like kathy was talking about you know whereas you know i think it stays more of a blessing you know if you've allowed if you if you allow yourself that freedom in terms of the, how you think about it Yep. No, I think that's a great point. There's a couple comments here in the chat box. Um, Joy says, let's see, Bill says, do you think the Sabbath was uh, construed so that followers would gather in one place in one day? There is an element of fellowship, a benefit of fellowship associated with Sabbath. So I think that's a, that's a, a valid point that you make there, uh, Bill. Uh, Joy says, and at Catholic, yes, it's a big no-no if you do not dedicate uh, Sunday to the uh, for the Lord, and and I actually talked to my brother a little bit about the, about that as well, and it is it is a big deal. I mean, Sunday is the Lord's day uh, mm -hmm. from a from a Catholic uh, theology perspective. Um, so I guess that would be in some respects it'd be like what Kathy was saying with regard to Lutheran. They would follow a similar practice there. Yeah, and it and it was it was. God's Day and then Family Day fellowship, because we would all go to Grandma's house and have dinner and fellowship. <laughs> so yeah. What's What's interesting to me is with the examples and even the comments here, everyone is conveying the huge value and benefit of doing it. Um, so there is no there's no challenge about that because you know continue whatever ways that we can build the relationship not through works but because of love of god is all pop you know all positive susan said that um oh you asked about what do they mean by dedicate no work well it depends yeah. yeah because um i mean some people just say that but sunday's just a day i mean it's not that they if you read angel's comment she said that it's a time to honor god not just abstain from work um so, I mean, I know, I mean, your brother included, I can't think of very many Catholics that actually after mass and maybe after some family and fellowship time really dedicate the Lord, the time to the Lord. They just don't, I mean, they may do nothing, but I don't know. I mean, I don't know that it's any different than just taking a day off of work. Mm. Mm. So, 
I think I think biblically the Sabbath meant a lot more than just not working. I mean, there was not working was a small part of it, but there was much more involved in that Sabbath than just simply not doing any work. But yeah, yeah. There's certainly about the worship and the relationship and the study and the fellowship. Yeah. But I would say um, it, from a very practical perspective, um, take take Christianity out for just a moment and just recognize the value and benefit of just taking a day of rest to recharge and rejuvenate the body. So th there's a benefit there as well. Someone else was going to say something. Uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, one of the things is like, for example, um, being from Puerto Rico, also, um, it it depends like in the area that you are, like, uh, the coastal area that is more city like, um, this is like more lax. But coming from Adjuntas, that is a mountainside, uh, the, with the new generations, the Catholic traditions they change a lot. Now they're more lax. But when I was growing up. It was um, the old school Catholic, almost Orthodox type of. So yes, uh, uh, practically the town was paralyzed during Sunday. It was a uh, very rare um, that was a store open, and that was only to provide, like let's say, for example, food because there were um, activities happening. Um, but the rest was paralyzed. Um, and yes, you had to go to church, and then from there you had to go to your um, Sunday classes, um, the majority of the old school type of uh, worship, they still they still do that. So practically you're spending uh, your whole day um, in the church environment. And then from there you go home to relax. So like I said before, it's depending on on, on the places. In Mexico, it's um, the Catholic church also works like that. It was um, very interesting to see uh, when it's, uh, the days of the Lord is completely paralyzed, and that's what you have to do. Mm -hmm. So I would say that after my little side study in this, you know, when I when I you know learned the reasons that both sides believe yes or no, and so when I reflected on myself, and I'll share this: is the Sabbath required? Not from a works perspective, it is not required. I don't believe it's all about the relationship, and it's growing the relationship. Uh, with regard to it, but I, and I think it's personal. I think it's personal as as we're talking through this tonight. If there if there is a if there's a nudging by the Holy Spirit that's saying no, you ought to be doing more more with regard to building your relationship with me. Um, then you ought to be listening to the word of the Holy Spirit. If you're treating a day as just a day, that, whew, it's off and I can go do whatever I want. I think you're losing the point here a little bit in terms of what the scripture in total is trying to teach us. So I'm not, I, I don't think that we need to be religious about it. Um, we absolutely need to be relationship about it in terms of, of what we do, you know, for the Sabbath, yes or no. And that's about the strongest answer that I can get. Um, any thoughts about that? Um, <clears throat> I like the, the scripture, the scriptures that come to mind is, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. Yes. And then there's, and I forget where it is, but it says all things permissible, but not all things are beneficial. Mm. That's a great summary. And That's it's a great summary. Uh, to me, I think the Sabbath was made for us to rest. And what does, what does God consider rest? And what do you do when you rest? Do you go in there, close your door, lock it, and go to sleep, pull the head covers over your head? Or do you, you and Susan, go on a vacation and spend time with each other or go visit the family? Or, you know, um, we see rest in a lot of different ways. Agreed. I agreed. Okay, well, sorry about taking everyone on that little rabbit trail. I just, what, what really intrigued me about this particular scripture is that both positions pointed to the same scripture to prove their point. I'm like, okay, uh-oh, that hurt my head. So I had to dig into a little bit deeper. Hopefully that was okay. All right, so I think I messed up my reading here a little bit. I think I need to read verse 11 as well, according to the, the, uh, the verse boss here. So verse 11. 
It says, let us therefore be diligent to enter that rest, lest, any, lest anyone fall according to the same example of disobedience. So another therefore we find here, and it's, it's representing in this case a repeated idea. And so we read about a doctrinal truth presented here. Here, the focus to enter God's rest if, if you don't do that, then one will experience the alternative disobedience. That's the message the author is saying here. He's saying, be diligent to enter that rest. And we're instructed to be diligent. And that's telling us that God doesn't force rest upon us. It is our choice to enter that rest. And I think that's another affirmation about the personalness of what we do here. And to enter this rest also requires faith this diligent faith that drives this path in growing our relationship with God. And it's telling us here that the faith that we have is not a passive faith. It's a diligent faith. It's a faith that we need to trust on and rely on as we cling to Jesus and, and his work for us and in us as we grow closer to him. And so the scripture warns us, it says, lest anyone fall according to the same example of disobedience. So what happens if we're not diligent? The result can be a disaster. We may fall as the example that we learned in chapter three of Israel did in the wilderness and, and wandering for, for 40 years. So here's, a, here's an illustration of this verse. Ultimately what it's doing is it's telling us to rest in God and to relate to him. The illustration is like riding a bike. So think about when you begin learning and you kind of wobble around, you maybe skin your knee a time or two, um, but then after a while, you kind of get it. Riding the bike becomes easy and becomes the easiest, most relaxing thing in the world. Well, for me, it is relaxing. Maybe for some others, it's not. But the illustration applies to a spiritual rest that we're talking about here. And so initially, as new Christians, as we're beginning our walk, we kind of wobble around, we wobble all over the road saying, well, what about this? Or how come that? And, and, and that can't be as we're trying to figure it out, as we're trying to build and grow in our relationship with Christ. But then when we finally learn the Christian walk and it's not about us and we learn that it's all about Jesus, it's not about what we must do, but it's a, what about Jesus has already done. That's when we can start to cruise. We take the pressure on us and we rely and lean on Jesus because of what he's done. And here's the hidden warning that the scriptures are saying if we go back and connect it to chapter 3. If we choose not to enter his rest, then we'll be like the children of Israel. We'll kind of wander year after year in the wilderness. It'll be dry. It'll be drought. We, we won't be blessed because we're trying to work our own salvation out of our own energy, never at peace, because we just can't believe God is as good as he promises to be. That's what we're trying to learn here. That's what the author is trying to teach us here. Any comments about um, the scripture up to this point? So Angel, if you will take us in verses 12 and 13, here we're gonna uh, learn about being found out by God's word. Let's see what that means. 12 and 13. For the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give account. Thank you, Angel. And so this is one of those scriptures that we often hear uh, repeated for the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two edged sword. And so God's word really kind of diagnoses a condition of us and within us. And, and God's word has this surgeon's precision, as, as you can just imagine it opening up our heart and accurately discerning what our spiritual health is. That's what the scripture is trying to tell us. It's living. It's powerful, it's active. And the word actually does a great job of exposing the weaknesses that we have or the unbelief that we may have. And, and we can see its inherent sharpness and its accuracy in revealing that to us. So why follow the word? 
the key is that when we read the word and we study the word, it's much, much more than having intellectual knowledge. It's much more than having biblical facts. When we read the word, we should see it really as a ministry, a ministry to us, that when it's combined with the Holy Spirit in us as Christians, really powerful things uh, begin to happen to us. It's so much more than just facts and history. You know, we could do a multiple week study on the ways in which the word helps us. You know, I created this list. I'm gonna share with you five things of a list of 25 ways in which the word can help us just to kind of highlight it. And I'm, I'm, if you want a area of scripture that, get, that illuminates a lot of these types of examples, go to Psalm 119. Psalm 119 is a great uh, chapter in the Bible that illustrates how the word actually helps us. Here's a couple of examples. Number one is it cleans us. If we take heed with God's word, um, our way will be cleansed. And that actually comes from multiple places, but one of them is Psalm 119, verse 9. You can also find it in John 15, 3, or Ephesians 5, 26. Another way that the word helps us is it's hidden in our hearts. It keeps us from sin. The very nature of having the word in our hearts reveals to us before we actually jump over the line and actually we sin. Psalm 119, verse 11. The word is a source of strength, Psalm 119, 28. The word gives peace to those who love it. They're secure and they're standing in a safe place. We can find that in Psalm 119, 165. So if you wanna do a, a side study, side, uh, read through Psalm 119, which will provide lots of examples of how the word helps us. And bring in uh, scripture from the New Testament the word, as we know, will actually build faith. And we can get that from Romans 10, 17. Countless ways that the Lord can help us. But a part of the scripture we're often very familiar with is where it says sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow. What a vivid picture this paints. And so God's word, when it's combined with the Holy Spirit, reaches us with this precision that embeds the word deeply in our hearts. I'm sure most of us have experienced this. We're sitting there on a Sunday sermon, we're watching a sermon on TV, and we find that the preacher's message, how can it be so relevant to our life during that sermon at this time? How does that happen? Do you ever wonder about that? We kind of wonder, does the, te does the preacher actually know some secret information about our life? But Candidly, the preacher is really just a messenger and he's using the sharpness of God's word and he's sharing the message at the right place in the right time for us. The sword that's depicted here in the scripture, it's a two-sided sword, two-edged sword. It doesn't have a blunt side. It cuts both this way and that way. But, it, but it, combined with those two sides, it also has a point. It has a point like a dagger. So we see the, the, uh, the word is actually has this piercing dagger and it points a revelation to us that will go through and, and cut us on each side. The scripture goes on and talks about how even the division of soul and spirit. So the author is digging a little bit deeper. What does he mean about the distinction between soul and spirit? So in the New Testament, two words are used. In the spirit, the word is pneuma. And that focuses on our spiritual aspect. That means our life in relation to God. What about the soul? The Greek for soul is psyche. And that refers to our life regardless of our spiritual experience. That's our life in relation to ourself, our emotions and our thought. So theologically, if we're talking soul and spirit, there's a strong contrast in the, in the Bible about that. But the author isn't talking theologically here. The author is actually talking poetically here. And what the author is trying to do is signify that the word, the word of God penetrates to the innermost us, the recesses of our spiritual being as a, spirit, as a sword will cut through the joints of marrow and bone. 
It's the depth in which the word enters into us and helps us reveal the actions and thoughts in which we should have. When we read the scripture that says all things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. Really, everyone knows this, that there's no one, none of us are hidden before God. He sees our heart. He knows our heart. He knows how to touch our heart. And we must give account to him on how we respond to that touch and that nudging that we receive. The word naked here reminds us that the way God saw through Adam and his feeble hiding after the sin in the garden, God sees through our hiding in the same way. The word open, open to the eyes of him, it's from the Greek, and it's, only, it's the only place that it's used in the New Testament. And it, the picture that it paints, it's, um, it's a kind of wrestlers, um, like grapplers, who had a hold on their, their opponent with this grip on their neck, and it was so powerful that it brought victory. That's what this word is referring to. The word can mean to prostrate or to overthrow or to more simply the sense of laying an opponent, opponent open and overcome him. So it's really showing the revealing and what God, God knows about us in terms of our, our actions and our thoughts and our walk. And so remember the context here. The, the author of Hebrews is actually writing to Hebrews who are Christian Jews and he's trying to make sure that they pierce the hearts of these Jews who thought about giving up on Jesus. And he's saying, no, 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 don't do that. God knows what you're thinking. Don't do that. Here, the author is making it clear they can't give up on Jesus because, and keep it hidden from God because God knows what's happening. The key here is that the word of God discovers and exposes their condition. That's what we're learning here in this scripture. So let me pause there. Any comments or questions about that? Okay, so let's finish up here in, ver in verses 15 and 16 and learn about our high priest. And so Susan, if you would take that, please. And Michelle, you're ab absolutely right. The, those two words together, living word, are so descriptive about what the author is trying to say right here. It is a living word. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has gone through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weakness, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet was without sin. Let Thank us then you, approach the Oops. throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Michelle, you were going to say something right before the, the started. Um, Because the living word, you could read, you could be studying a scripture and then later on in your life, study that same scripture and it's going to impact you in a different way, depending on what's going on in the circumstances. It so. drives me crazy. You're absolutely right. It's and the timing is like perfect. Why does wh how does he do that? Just how does he do it? I don't know. Joy says we better talk the talk and walk the walk. If not, we will not rest in him. Amen to that. Amen. Okay, so to finish up for tonight, we're learning about our high priest. And the idea is here is that Jesus is our high priest. We've already heard this concept in Hebrews chapter 2 and in Hebrews chapter 3. So this isn't new, but now the idea will be developed a little bit deeper here. It says, seeing then, the author here is calling attention to the specific, unique character of Jesus, who is our high priest. As the high priest, Jesus is being called great. Um, it passed through the heavens. He's a son of God. And no one is described with these qualities, the qualities of Jesus here. The Hebrew author has been very careful to share both the deity of Jesus, as we learned way back in chapter 1, while also remembering his compassionate humanity, as we learned in Hebrews chapter 2. So nicely integrated uh, scripture here. And what it really means is that Jesus, 
as the Son of God, he's enthroned in heaven as our high priest, and he can actually sympathize with our weaknesses. Here's a contrast. At this time, the ancient Greeks, the primary attribute uh, of God was uh, apathia, uh, like apathy, this, this essential inability to feel anything at all. And the point that the author is making here is Jesus isn't like that. He knows and feels what we specifically go through. The, the ancient Greek word that's translated sympathize literally means to suffer along with. That's what the Jesus is suffering along with us as he's sympathizing with us. So what makes the difference here is that Jesus, by coming to be with us and living among us, added humanity to his deity when he lived among us. And you think about when you've been there, it makes all the difference. You know, think about this. We hear about some, some tragedy, you know, on the news. And it may impact us. We may feel a measure of sorrow. But it's really a whole new level of the pain that we would feel if it actually occurred to our family or a friend or in our own neighborhood. Jesus coming to, to be with us, with his humanity, he experienced it. It wasn't head knowledge. It was heart knowledge. And there's a huge difference here. The scripture says, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. And that's a key here. So Jesus knows about temptation. He knows about the battle against sin because he battled against sin. But he was never stained by sin. And that sinfulness that he had was an earned sinlessness. And he gained victory after victory in this constant battle with temptation that life in this world entails, the, some, the, the temptations that he had in front of Satan, outside of Satan, it doesn't matter. He fought them all and was successful. So think about this. Sometimes we might think that because Jesus is God, he could never know temptation the way we do. You know, it might be partly true, you know, but Jesus did face temptation, as I said, and in effect, he actually faced it more severely than we ever will. Why would I say that? Because he actually understands temptations in ways that we don't. Because only the one who never gives in to temptation knows the full strength of temptation. So just think about that. Think about a time that when you've been tempted and you're like, you have a decision to make. And if you think about the the moving forward through the temptation and following through, and you think about a time when you didn't follow through the temptation, what happens in your mind is significantly different. So in every single case in which Jesus was provided a temptation, he never went through it. He never, he never succumbed to it. And so because he only, so I'm going to state it this way. Jesus faced temptation from an outer perspective, not from an inner perspective. The inner perspective is when he actually faced it and carried it out, but he didn't, he never did that. So we never made it to the level of actually taking what was an outside stimulus and make it an internal action. He didn't do that. He knew the strength and, and fury of this external temptation in a way and to a degree that we could never know. He knows what we go through. And in fact, he actually faced worse. Just imagine the temptation of Jesus in front of Satan, 40 days, no food, no water. And then the temptation happens, the challenges that he went through. So then it says it's to sympathize. Jesus now sympathizes with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted. And so, yep, as I said, he can sympathize with our weaknesses, he can sympathize with our temptation, but he can't sympathize with our sin because he never sinned. We often have this tendency to doubt, uh, to fear, and to focus on our inadequacy rather than God's sufficiency. But this author here is pointing to G Jesus, our great high priest, that he actually understands. How does he know how I'm feeling? Our text tells us because he was tempted the way we are. 
a temptation that would cause him to be compassionate high priest, a temptation that would cause Jesus to empathize with me would be a genuine temptation for him. And so we finish off the scripture where we get this invitation to come to the throne of grace. It says, let us therefore come boldly. We have this high priest, we have Jesus, who is both omnipotent and he's, and he's compassionate. And we can come boldly to him and to his throne. Keep in mind in the back of your mind that Satan, he's got a central strategy. And that strategy he has is to discourage us, discourage us from this access to Jesus. The devil sometimes wants us to consider Jesus an unapproachable, to make us shy away and back up from him. Sometimes Satan wants us to think of Jesus as being powerless to help. He's not, he can't help us. Not as one who sits on the throne in heaven. That's one of the, the challenges that Satan puts in front of us. So what does boldly mean in the scripture? What it doesn't mean is it doesn't mean boldly, doesn't mean proudly, doesn't mean arrogantly, it doesn't mean with presumption. Boldly means that we may come constantly, without a reservation, come freely, no fancy words, and with confidence, and we should come with persistence. That's what the, the author here is telling us to come boldly, boldly to the throne of grace, this throne of grace, this throne of God is a throne of grace. So when we come, we may obtain mercy. We ought to have confidence that we may obtain mercy. And keep in mind, mercy is this is not getting what we deserve. We're getting mercy. We're not getting what we deserve. We can also find grace on this th throne of grace. And grace is getting what we don't deserve in our time of need. So mercy is not getting what we deserve. Grace is getting what we don't deserve. What a combination. What's interesting about this is that the ancient Jewish rabbis actually taught that God had two thrones, one of mercy and one of judgment. And they said this because they knew that God was both merciful and just, but they couldn't reconcile these two attributes of God. They thought that perhaps God had two thrones to display these two aspects of his character. On one throne, he showed judgment. On the other throne, he showed mercy. But here, in light of the finished work of Jesus and what he's done, we see mercy and judgment reconciled into one throne of grace. That's what the scripture says here. And the key is this. Remember that grace doesn't ignore God's justice. It actually operates in fulfillment of God's justice in light of what happens on the cross. And so we'll finish up here tonight with the final uh, part of the scripture here, which says, find grace in time of help and need. What an encouragement to the Hebrews when the time the book was written and to us today. So thankfully, we should all know and be comforted to know that God provides help in our time of need. That's what he does. No request that we have is too small from him. He wants us to be anxious for nothing. Philippians 4, 6 tells us, but in everything by prayer, let your requests be known to God. That's the closure for Hebrews chapter 4 tonight. Any comments about that? I love this chapter 4 here tonight. I thought it was a really good chapter in terms of what it's trying to convey and communicate and teach us. So... Uh, thanks for everyone's interaction. My dear, my dear wifey, would you mind close us in a prayer tonight? Okay. After you take yourself off mute. I did. Oh, Father God, we just love you. We thank you for everything. Lord, you are so powerful, so worthy of all of our worship, Lord, and we just give that to you. Lord, I thank you for your mercies, your mercies for our sins, Lord. And I thank you for the grace that will cover us in the future, Lord. Um, I just pray for just a application of what we learned tonight, just to fill our week. Um, we just, uh, we just love you and we praise your holy name. Amen. Amen. Thank